Hi everyone, hey, we are jumping into a brand new series on the original context of Christmas. And we're gonna look at the story through various characters to understand at a deeper level what's going on with the Christmas story. And if you've followed us for any length of time, you will know that studying the Bible in its original context allows the stories to make more sense. They deepen your understanding of the stories, but in some cases, it fundamentally changes it. And so we're gonna tackle things like, was Jesus really born on December 25th? Um, why was the announcement first given to lowly shepherds? Were there really only three magi, or were there a whole lot more than that? Uh, we're gonna be tackling that and so much more in this series. And just to give you a heads up as well, this first episode has a lot of foundation stones. And so we go a few minutes longer than what we normally do for a teaching series episode, but hang with us. There are a lot of pieces here that are gonna enhance your experience of Christmas. So thanks so much for joining. Let's dig in. Oh, we've been so excited about doing this series for some time. And when I say we, I'm doing that intentionally because we have a teacher, now part of Walking the Text, that's gonna be jumping in to the teaching series. And I'm gonna have a chance to more formally introduce you to him in our next episode, but let me give you a heads up. It is Brad Nelson. Many of you know Brad Nelson. He's been part of our Infusion Bible Conference faculty for the last several years. And he is an outstanding communicator, teacher, and he has been our content director here at Walking the Text for nearly the last year. And Brad and I have been uh, the best of friends since college. And he served as a pastor for more than 20 years. And so if you're not familiar with Brad, you're gonna love him. And yes, it's gonna be confusing because now we got Brad and Brad. Um, one has hair, one does not, so there you go. All right, well, we're gonna jump into part one here of Characters of Christmas. And I wanna talk about the character of the city of Bethlehem. Now, I know you may not have thought that's where we were gonna go first. You probably would've thought, well, what about the shepherds or the magi? And we're gonna get into all of that. But there's something about the ethos of Bethlehem that I believe is really fundamental and central to the Christmas story. Now, we've got Christmas carols about, oh, little town of Bethlehem. You know, here in this first verse, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. There is this hopefulness around Bethlehem. And that also stems from passages in the Older Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, such as Micah 5.2, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient times. And it's talking about the Messiah that was to come, that would lead Israel, and the birth would happen in Bethlehem. So there's all of these hopes and dreams and expectations connected to the city of Bethlehem. But for us in our Christmas story, we almost look negatively upon Bethlehem. That when we think about, oh, little town of Bethlehem, we think about a town that did not receive Mary and Joseph and Jesus, but rejected Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. I mean, just think about all of our Christmas pageants, right? You've got Mary and Joseph, they show up into Bethlehem. Mary is about to give birth and they're frantically trying to find a place to be able to give birth and their family rejects them and they go to the local inn and the innkeeper says no vacancy and you've got this mean old you know, innkeeper who turns them away. And so this couple goes to a far side of Bethlehem and they give birth in a stable, isolated, rejected, shamed and away from everyone else. And my question for us today is, is this an accurate portrayal of what happened in Bethlehem at the birth of Jesus? Well, my contention is it is not, that it is fundamentally flawed in so many ways. And we need to dig into the history, the culture, the language, the visual settings to understand what is being communicated in Luke chapter two. So let's jump into Luke 2, and we're gonna start with verse four, because in the first few verses, 
the Caesar Augustus decree goes out and everybody's got to go to their town to register. And so we read, now Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Now, quick pause here. That's interesting because the city of David was actually Jerusalem. But what Luke is doing here is he's keying us in to the importance of Bethlehem being the city of where the descendant of David, the one who would rule on David's throne, is going to come from and be birthed within. And he says this in the very next line, because he was of the house and family of David. Again, he's going above and beyond to connect you in to the larger story of all the prophecies in the Hebrew scripture. And then it says, in order to register along with Mary, who was betrothed to him and was pregnant. And then verse six, while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Another quick pause here. Recognize they've been in Bethlehem for some time before Mary actually has to give birth. Again, all of our stories are so quick in our Christmas pageants. The moment they cross the threshold, she's giving birth. Her water breaks. We got to find a place to give birth to Jesus. Listen, they were there for days. Some even suggest a couple of weeks before Mary gives birth, which means Joseph has plenty of time to find appropriate accommodations for Mary to give birth to Jesus. And then we come to verse seven, where we're gonna camp in the, for the rest of this episode. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Every single word here is important. Let's first focus in on this word in. The word that Luke uses is the word kataluma. And kataluma does not mean inn as we think of an inn. It actually means a guest room, a guest chamber, or even, get this, an upper room. Now, if Luke wanted to key us in or pull us into a context around an inn, like a commercial inn as we think of it, he would have used the word pandokion, which means a traveler's lodge or an inn. And Luke knows this word because in the parable of the Good Samaritan, that's the word he uses for inn in Luke 10. So Luke has used this word before. It comes later in the gospel and it is around a commercial inn. So a better translation, a more updated way of saying this is that there was no room for them in the guest room. And you're starting to see this in newer translations. Now, so here's what we need to recognize. There's no inn in Luke 2, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't an inn in Bethlehem. We're not saying that. We're just saying that Luke isn't talking about an inn in Luke 2. Uh, Bethlehem sat on a major road running through the high hill country of Judea. Um, it was right off of the Central Ridge Route or Watershed Ridge Route or Patriarchal Highway. We've got a number of different terms for this road that people traverse through the hill country. And so Bethlehem was on a major stretch of the road. But Bethlehem was not a very big city. I mean, if you go to Bethlehem today, here's an aerial shot of it. I mean, there's people everywhere because this is where Jesus was born. But Jesus's birthplace of Bethlehem in the first century would have been a much smaller village or town, somewhere between maybe 500 and 1,000 people. Um, high estimates I've seen around 2,000. So we're not dealing with a big metropolis here. We're dealing with a smaller town or village. Now, Cindy Parker, in her book, um, Encountering Jesus in the Real World of the Gospels, writes a network of inns, and she talks then about the Pandokians, that house travelers did exist along Roman roads. However, those kinds of accommodations were not available everywhere. They existed primarily along Roman roads, not in the small towns. Now, Bethlehem was not off of a Roman-esque kind of road. It's an important road that ran through the high hill country, but also Bethlehem isn't all that big. Now, some may contend that there was an inn in Bethlehem, and if so, great, but that's not what Luke is talking about. There is no inn in Luke 2. There is a guest room, and there's no room for them in the guest room. Which leads to the question, then where's the guest room? Like help us to understand the context of where are we at in a particular home? 
Well, homes in the first century world, even as they are today in the Middle East, are not very big. They're small, and most homes typically had two rooms, maybe three rooms. If you are a wealthy family, then you would have more than that. But most people just had a couple of rooms, three typically at most for the commoner. And here's a really great artist rendering of what a typical home would have looked like. And there's no set floor plan, but they're all the same kind of characteristics. And one of those things that you see here is you actually have a quote unquote stable that's within the home. Typically, families had a couple of sheep and goats and maybe a donkey. They didn't have very much. And because their assets were in their animals, they would not leave their animals out overnight that would be susceptible to theft or to the you know, inclement weather if it was like the winter time. They would bring them into the home and especially in the winter, it'd provide heat to the house. And in order to feed the animals during the night so you didn't have to get up, you have mangers, feeding troughs, that were oftentimes either set on top of the floor for the animals to reach over, or they were actually cut into the living area that stood above the animal area. And so you've got that, then you go up the steps, and then you're in the main living area, and typically the members of the household would sleep towards the back, and you might have a second level. And if you have a second level, you would typically have a guest room or an upper room, a kataluma. And so here's one floor plan, and similar to this, this is from Kenneth Bailey, um, in his book, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, is basically that floor plan right there, just knowing that there would be an upper room on top of that. Another possibility that Kenneth Bailey depicts is that the guest room was not up, but it was in the back. And some scholars will say it actually may have had, you know, been up towards the front. And really the answer could be yes, because different houses just based on, you know, where they decided to put the guest room, it could be in the back, it could be in the front, but you have a guest room there. And so here are some just artist renderings that are just really well done that gives you a sense, a cutaway here of what the house would have looked like and what would have to have upper rooms and to have you know, one look of a, a stable within your home. And again, it's a very small area because you don't have very many animals. Um, here's another one as well, and you can see this is a cutaway that would have been underneath the floors. The animals are in like a cave-like structure. And then you've got access to the main level and above. This artist rendering shows something very similar. You've got the animals here. The cataluma would be up here. Perhaps this is where the family or you know some of the family members would sleep. Here is one where they've actually rebuilt a home and said, here's what it would look like to actually walk through it today. Same thing, here's your stable area right there. There's your cataluma up there. And again, maybe you had an upper, but maybe you had something under your home. Uh, this is in Bethlehem area where you have like a cave-like structure and then the house is built on top. In fact, this is how many homes began in the Bethlehem area is you got caves all over the place. And so you would originally live into the cave and then as you expanded, the house would just basically go up and you'd build on top of the cave and then you would have access to the cave and you would use the cave as an area to house your animals. Um, in fact, the traditional location for the birth of Jesus, the Church of the Nativity, the church stands over that ancient cave um, in Bethlehem today. And so we see this preserved from an archeological perspective, whether this is exactly where Jesus was born uh, or not, we don't know for certain, but there is definitely a cave area and it makes sense from the just archeological remains in Bethlehem. So we've got a guest room and we're told that there was no room for them. And so one of the questions becomes is why is there no room for Mary and Joseph? Why did they have to give birth somewhere else in connection to the house? Well, there's actually a question before that that would be helpful to answer, and that is why would Mary and Joseph be welcomed? Because one aspect of the story is that they struggled to understand, well, how is Mary pregnant if they didn't have relations? And that relations would have happened before they were officially married. That's problematic. Well, most scholars in the contextual world will say, regardless of the circumstances, they would have been accepted by family in Bethlehem. Uh, and so 
The first thing is, is that we have mandatory hospitality in the ancient world and even today in the Middle East, but definitely in the first century world. And that hospitality came in the form of protection and provision. And there are a plethora of passages about hospitality and how you would extend that even to the stranger and protect them even above your own household, which is hard for us in the West to understand. But this is part of what's ingrained in Middle Eastern culture. Listen, Joseph is family. He's from Bethlehem and family would have accepted him in. What's more is he's also the royal lineage of David and Luke has reminded you of that already in Luke chapter two. Mary has relatives in the area. In the previous chapter, she's already spent significant time with Zechariah and Elizabeth in the hill country of Judea. Bethlehem is in Judea. They're not far from where Zechariah and Elizabeth were. And knowing that Mary spent all that time and was welcomed by Zachariah and Elizabeth, perhaps word had spread about these unique circumstances around Joseph and Mary. And if those hadn't spread and Joseph and Mary show up in Bethlehem and they're getting the cold shoulder and they're feeling rejected and they don't feel like this is a hospitable place for Mary to give birth, then they could have just gone to Zachariah and Elizabeth's house. So the fact that Mary has relatives in the area, perhaps that has kind of warmed the people of Bethlehem and qualmed any concerns that they may have heard through the grapevine about Joseph and Mary. What's more, Mary is pregnant. I love what Kenneth Bailey writes here. He says, in every culture, a woman about to give birth is given special attention. Simple rural communities the world over always assist one of their own women in childbirth, regardless of the circumstances. The number one killer of women in the ancient world was childbirth. It is a scary, precarious time, and you surround a pregnant woman who is about to give birth and ensure she has everything she needs regardless of the circumstances. And so this now leads us to the other question, then why didn't Mary and Joseph get the cataluma? Why didn't they get the guest room? Well, there's a, some practical reasons. The first is other family guests were perhaps occupying it. Uh, Benjamin Foreman, in his article in the Lexham Geographic Commentary on the Gospel, says this. He says, since Bethlehem was very crowded because of the census, the guest room was probably already full of visitors when Mary and Joseph arrived. As a good Middle Eastern host, the head of the house could not turn the couple away, nor would he ask his guests to find alternate lodging. The best solution, therefore, would have been to invite them to stay with his family in the main quarters of his house. So a second possibility here though, is that it wasn't the appropriate place to give birth. And Dr. Paul Wright, who served as the president of Jerusalem University College for nearly 25 years, um, did a fantastic podcast with Cindy Parker, Dr. Cindy Parker, on this very um, part of Luke too. And he just said that he has talked to many women in Bethlehem who say at the moment of birth, or just right before the birth, they move the woman to a part of the house where the rest of the family is not, especially no men. There's always midwives, there's always women, but to stay away from the children and others because if something goes sideways, they don't want everybody being in the middle of that. And so oftentimes they will take them down to the lower part of the house, which happens to be the cave area or the stable area that would have been cleaned and prepared for it to be a hospitable place for the birth. And he talks about how idiomatically speaking, Luke may be saying, yeah, the cataluma is not the right place. It's not the right place in the house to do this. And so there's a possibility there. Now, when you get to that stable area, there are no animals. Or if there is, there's maybe a donkey and they probably took the donkey out and you go, but yeah, but what about sheep and goats? Well, we find out in the narrative, right, that the shepherds are in the fields keeping watch over their flock at night. The flocks are not within the city. And so the stable was available. And now some have suggested that they had shamed the family. And I, I don't think this is the case. Uh, some people are gonna make a strong argument for this. The vast majority of scholars in the contextual world contend that it was a very receiving environment for Jesus to be born. And so if in fact they had been shamed by the family, if in fact they were in poor circumstances in a bad situation, then Kenneth Bailey contends the shepherds would have done something about it. But the shepherds saw nothing wrong with the circumstances. In fact, we have in Luke 2.20, and the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as been told them. 
Uh, Kenneth Bailey says, if on arrival they had found a smelly stable, a frightened young mother, and a desperate Joseph, they would have asked, or they would have said, this is outrageous. Come home with us, our women will take care of you. The fact that they walked out without moving the young family means that the shepherds felt that they could not offer better hospitality than what had already been extended to them. And so we return back to this well-known passage and there's just one more piece just to lay this final kind of stone for you in creating a better foundation for understanding Luke 2 is that it says that she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. Now recognize this is after the birth that Jesus is put into a manger. Where would a manger be? Well, if they did give birth in the under part of the house in the cave area, then of course you would have a manger nearby. This is where the animals would normally be. But there's another possibility here, is that once Mary has given birth to Jesus, they have now brought him back up into the main family living area, and you have the mangers, again, cut into the floors or a movable wooden one, where they would have put Jesus and he would be right in the middle of the family. And so we, we just don't know, but it's not that Jesus was under all of this shame and rejection by the people of Bethlehem, at least what I'm contending here in this teaching. What doesn't change though, is that Jesus was born into poor and humble circumstances. That is consistent through and through. And you even see another element of this later in Luke 2, where when Mary and Joseph go to Jerusalem to present Jesus, according to the law, every firstborn child that opens a womb shall be called holy to the Lord and essentially is bought back by providing a sacrifice. And Luke gives this to us, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, this is a reference back to Leviticus 12, 6 to 8. And if you go there, you will find that the normal sacrifice was a lamb. But if you were poor and you could not afford a lamb, then this is what you would offer. And that's what Mary and Joseph offer. They are a poor teenage couple. And the fact that they're not wealthy would also seem to imply that they wouldn't have had enough money to buy a donkey or have a donkey which means that Mary probably didn't show up into Bethlehem on a donkey. She probably walked very pregnant, probably very uncomfortable, as only I can imagine, into the city of Bethlehem. Jesus was born into poor and humble circumstances, but I don't believe that he was born into a rejection setting. In fact, I believe wholeheartedly that people welcomed him with wonder. And as we are now entering into our Christmas season, our prayer is that this is true for you as well. That when we just reconsider and ponder once again the miracle of Christmas, that God who came in human form chose to enter into human existence as a poor, helpless babe to a poor teenage couple in humble circumstances in a little town of Bethlehem, it reminds us that God's love knew no bounds, that Jesus identified with our life, with our story, with our existence. And so as we consider this story anew, as we dig deeper into the Christmas story, may we be brought to that same awe and wonder once again that I believe that those who saw Jesus at his birth also had. So friends, we're just getting started. Characters of Christmas, part one. Four more parts to go. We're really excited about where this series is gonna to continue to go. But may you enjoy this Christmas season. May you be brought to awe and wonder. And as always, may you walk out the text well in your life.